Hey, how you going, random stranger? We have three episodes of Aria booked for today, which means more chill and more fuzzy warmth to enjoy. And that'll take us to the end of season one. Last time we met the star-like fairy, aka Obachan, aka sweet badass independent farmer lady, and also the former greatest Undine of all time. Uh, the title itself, Starlike Fairy, is interesting. One way I can think of in which Obachan is like a star is uh, her attitude and her advice of enjoying everything in the moment. And like maybe she's more of a shooting star, which of course is what the girls saw at the end of episode nine. And basically she embodied the philosophy uh, or the outlook that Arya as a show embraces, that of mono no aware, that any given moment only lasts for so long, and the way to really live is to be fully present in all of life's ups and downs, and to not just accept impermanence, but to welcome it with open arms. Uh, and it's an attitude that Obashan has clearly passed down in the Arya company to Alicia and then now to Akari. Um, or I was thinking the causation is probably the other way around where people who tend to enjoy all of the little things in life or can see the positive side in everything tend to be recruited to Arya company. Um, because Akari, funnily enough, didn't even know who Obachan was, or she didn't know that Obachan was the founder of Aria Company. It's also odd, I thought, that Alicia never thought to mention it to Akari, unless Akari forgot, but it just doesn't seem like the kind of thing that she would forget. Uh, in any case, I don't think Obachan cares either way whether the younger Undines who came after her know who she is. Clearly, most of them, other than Akari, do know about Obachan. But for Obachan, it's the love of being an Undine is that's the most important thing. It's not the fame and not the fortune, uh, or I guess the legacy of having been unmatched in all aspects of Undining. Like last time, I think I, it was just the way that they spoke about her skills felt like she was an amalgamation of Alicia, Akira, and Athena all in one. How is it that the girls came to find Barchan? It's because uh, Aika is feeling uninspired. Like, with their training, they're just going around and around in circles and not making any progress, which is such a relatable struggle, no matter what it is that you're working on. Uh, Firstly, though, can we just appreciate for a second that group training is now a normal thing for these girls? Alice in particular, who until very recently was uh, kind of safely wrapped in her solitary bubble and her melancholy to the point where she is now comfortable just instantly and very disdainfully dissing and teasing Akira. Not Akira. The day that I don't ever mess up one of the girls' names is going to be a cause for celebration. Uh, yeah, my point is, it's just a joy watching Alice being so comfortable with her friends now. Uh, so that is, on a personal level, huge progress. Second, this conversation around the speed of their training uh, and their progress in terms of technical skills brings up this central paradox of being an Undine. Um, Aika feels that they're moving too slowly and not getting good fast enough. But as we learn from the, the legendary great fairy herself, part of being a great Undine or one of the best is the ability to take your time and relax and just take things as they come. Throughout the episode, we see Aika pushing the other two to take things more seriously, to treat grandmother with the utmost respect, as in, you know, don't just call her grandma, call her grandmother. Just really putting Obachan on that pedestal and making Akari even more nervous than she already was. 
So Akira is under the impression that they have visited Obachan for some special elite Undine training. In every little thing that Obachan says to them or tells them to do, she looks for a secret lesson, which is understandable. She she doesn't want to miss out on this very rare opportunity to learn these supposed deep secrets to becoming a great prima Undine. But when there doesn't really seem to be any purpose to the trip other than to just have a genuinely good time. Akira starts worrying that Obachan thinks they're not even worth teaching, um, that they're not good enough. I feel uh, Aika's attitude or her worry about not being good enough is, uh, is akin to that universal struggle of every human being who has to figure out how to survive or to su- succeed in this life. Uh, we... We go to school, some of us go on to university or take up a trade, and we need to each figure out what success looks like to us. And often people go down this route of um, comparing themselves to others, like how much money we have and how much recognition we get from other people or how many qualifications we've got under our belts. And some people feel this pressure to stand out or to be successful more than others and it's not necessarily a bad thing uh it is healthy i think to have goals and ambitions and to be competitive however it can become a major stumbling block when the drive to succeed uh and excel is like the primary or the only focus of your life or when your definition of success is entirely defined by how you compare relative to others. So what's the alternative then, if there is any? Uh, And in episode 9, we get an answer when the girls go outside to do some stargazing, and then Obachan comes along and very kindly puts on these padded kimonos on them, and Aika, she can't hold back anymore, and asks her how to become a great Prima Undine. And Obatan at first answers her question with another question, which is, well, what do you think of Alicia? Obviously, Alicia is at the top of her game. So what's her secret? And the secret to success, which is really no secret at all, is that Alicia can, quote, make anything fun. Um, So I took that to mean she's not focused on being the best rather she just enjoys her chosen vocation uh, and and to quote Abartan again you know what you see hear and touch um, if you can take everything the world gives you and make it into something you enjoy then becoming the brightest star Undine in Aqua isn't a dream so there is no secret to being the best Undine beyond the very simple act of enjoying rowing your gondolas. Or to translate into general terms, it's all you have to do is just enjoy what you do. And so, yeah, it holds true, I think, for any field or any job. It's this virtuous cycle where if you enjoy what you're doing, you tend to do well at something. And when you do well at something, you tend to enjoy it more. It also presents another paradox because though the concept is simple, find enjoyment in everything you do, uh, actually doing it is incredibly difficult, especially if you're not an Alicia or an Akari who um, naturally has that kind of let it be attitude. For example, Akari, very naturally and kind of sentimentally observes that the the starry sky that they're seeing is the only one that they'll see that night uh, and it is like a she calls it like a once in a lifetime treasure uh, also her final wish at the end of that episode to be the happiest and most wonderful star undine on all of aqua she she makes that um she understands that deep interrelation of happiness with success as an Undine. Uh, and so <clears throat> she is, I guess, already halfway or out of all three of them, uh, Akari is the one who just naturally finds joy in everything. To her, 
every moment is special in its own way and you should as much as you can enjoy what's in front of you. Uh, unlike Aika, who is always looking out for what's next or what this moment might mean in the future and how to take advantage of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Akari's attitude extends to tough times as well. When things happen that upset or sadden her, and to be able to take those things, those bad things, or as a Bajan calls it, the spice in life, and find positive ways of looking at them or ways in which you can grow from them. Uh, if you're not an Akari, that really takes time and conscious effort to do. Curiously, Aika assumed that Abashan would have worked Alicia to the bones or until her hands bled. And we talked about like the tough teacher trope last time. And we did conclude that Akira, Akira clearly isn't the type to abuse her students. But Aika still has somehow managed to pick up this idea that to do well, you must have a teacher who whips you into shape with no mercy. And it is somewhat sad actually that she can still imagine Obachan to be capable of that even after having met her despite her whole character being so sweet and there's nothing to indicate that she would ever ever do that to anyone so it really comes down to Aika being unable to imagine any other way for a young Undine to become the greatest and just this disbelief in her that it could be so simple as loving what you do um, I also noticed that she called Alicia the number one Undine star on Aqua. Uh, and I just thought how lucky she was that Akira wasn't around because otherwise she probably would have been taken out back and murdered. The village that Obachan lives in is interestingly based on like an old fashioned Japanese style village on Manhome. Uh, and also a note on the railway station itself. I just loved how isolated and minimal it was and it made me wonder if there are actual train stations out there like that in the real world so for reference i found one in uh in scotland it's called the and i'm gonna ruin this uh pronunciation the kuro railway station which kind of looks like the one that was in aria and it's just so bizarre to me as a city girl like that you can have stations like that and in aria it's actually even less than what you see there. Uh, it's like you can barely see the train tracks and almost like they had disappeared in the episode. And I just thought that just the aura of that train station and how out of the way it was lent even more weight to the fantastical, the fantastical feel of the world of Ariel. Some more final noteworthy points about episode nine. Uh, I enjoyed seeing Alice so casually being a boss and excelling as usual at everything that she did. For the perfectionist that she is, it is even more gratifying to see how she really did enjoy herself uh, and what they got to do at a bar chance place. Uh, she has always been naturally gifted. Her issue was really more figuring out how to uh, take things easy and enjoy what she was already good at. So clearly Akari's influence and the mere fact of having friends is doing her wonders. Uh, and also next, like when they see the shooting stars, uh, they all make the same wish to become number one Undine on Aqua. Uh, ironically, just after Abashan told them that they uh, already have it in them to become it. But also, you know, uh, like a little extra luck wouldn't hurt. Um, also, the fact that they could all make that heartfelt wish to be number one, <laughs> even though there's three of them. Uh, so they are, again, they've always been in competition with each other, but this is not a show where that kind of competition turns foul or brings out the worst in its characters. Uh, so I think I find that really wholesome too. And I wish that the world could be like that. <laughs> uh, finally, and I ranted about this last time, but the amount of food 
that Obatran put out on the table for them was ridiculous. And I assumed that everything was homegrown or foraged, which makes the volume of it even more amazing. Episode 10, That Warm Holiday. And the key message in this one uh, seemed to be it's okay to rest every now and then. And as we already know, it is incredibly difficult to become a good Undine, particularly in the middle of winter where you have to grip those wooden oars in that freezing cold weather. But the girls are well on their way and they do have that fighting spirit in them. Uh, But also part of the training too, as Alicia says in this episode, is to learn when to relax because without that, they won't be able to make it through the winter. Or in other words, this long, tough journey of becoming a prima undine. And um, basically, it's it's like you need to pace yourselves. The use of winter to symbolize something tough or arduous that you have to go through and endure was interesting. Uh, in a continuation of the last episode's um, lesson to practice that attitude of appreciating life's every moment even the tough times Akari learns to appreciate the unique experiences of winter so the beautiful sunsets and the fireplaces that they start and the onsen Uh, so winter is very cold but there are a lot of things that make up for that and in the same way in life sometimes it takes time to appreciate the, the good things that can come out of some very hard situations. Um, I mean, hindsight is a gift and I can think of several things in my life that weren't pleasant to go through at all at the time. But later, when, I, when you look back, you know, it really shaped my character in ways that I'm grateful for now. Um, and also just putting in a note on mental health. Like sometimes these tough situations go on for quite a long time and in line with the message of this episode it's important to take time out uh to look after yourself mentally you know go and talk to someone uh take a day off and just recharge to make sure that you can endure the uncertainty of situations that don't necessarily resolve themselves quickly we met our first snow bugs, which I didn't know were actual things until I watched this episode. <laughs> uh, and when it gets really cold, they return to the ash trees. And that is like the sign that winter has fully been set upon the world. And like everyone else in Aqua, it seems that the snow bugs are also very sociable. Uh, like between this moment and when Akari takes the snowbug back to the city, she's already put a pink ribbon on it and it let her. So, <laughs> uh, and what else? Oh, yes. In another tiny remark that sort of fills in more of the overall picture of what's happening on Earth, Alicia said that these snowbugs on Aqua are a much larger species than the ones that you find back on Manhome. And I don't know. Take what you will from that. Maybe, again, just continuing that theme of environmental degradation. Like, species are have devolved to the point of becoming smaller or to survive. I don't know. Uh, and another comment from Akari, actually, in the previous episode, also built on that theme of man home being a hell pit that we don't really talk too much about, when she just casually throws out that... Uh, no one can plant things in the soil or in the ground anymore on Manhome. And she is also amazed that the potatoes that they're digging out are all different shapes and sizes, which implies the ones back on Earth are all perhaps artificially shaped and potentially just come out in bars. Uh, So as always, whenever we get these little remarks on Manhome, in classic Arya style, the scene immediately just moves on from this hint of a doomsday scenario to more very chill scenes back on Aqua. Again, Arya just never going beyond the superficial when it comes to discussing what's happening on Earth, and it doesn't have to. There are quite a few highlights uh, at the onsen, 
um, the trip that our girls plus Alicia take. All of these nice, tiny little character moments. Uh, Alice immediately agreeing to go with them. That did not escape my attention. Uh, because recall how the very first time she met Akari, she was so hesitant to accept any sort of invitation that was extended to her. So she, again, has come a long way. Uh, there was Akari and Alicia being in this state of weary acceptance that Aika cares about nothing else but going to the onsen with Alicia. And we were also reminded that Aika, um, as the heiress of a dynasty Undine company, she is likely from a very rich family. And hence, I guess that would kind of explain her knowing or having connections to one of the best onsens in the city. And it was also sweet that Alicia had already been to this onsen before, but was too polite to say anything because she knew how much Aika wanted to impress her. Uh, it was also interesting seeing Akari's culture shock when she learnt about public baths, which apparently is not a thing on Manhome. Uh, sometimes I tend to forget that she has not actually been on Aqua for that long. And it kind of makes you wonder how many other cultural differences there are between, um, you know, her and the people of Aqua. Uh, or maybe the cultural shock was just from the country that she was from. Either the country or the fact that Manhome, again, because remember from a few episodes back, you can't actually swim in the sea anymore. And so maybe this idea of having a public bath where you can have all this water to freely just bathe in is an unthinkable luxury on earth. Um, Because I imagine people from Japan, uh, though they were new immigrants to Aqua, they would fit right in with the onsen culture unless many, many, many generations have passed uh, when water to bathe in was a concept on earth. So yeah, it's, it's so, it's fun trying to pass what's going on, um, on earth through Akari's responses to things on Aqua and just being like, wait, she doesn't have any inkling of, of why people would do this. It's like all these little luxuries that we take for granted now, I guess that, uh, people have taken with them to Aqua but people from Manhome have no idea about. As soon as I saw the exterior of that onsen, I knew it was going to be amazing. I just really loved the details of the old cracks in the walls and that that was the freaking view out of their room window. And most of the house is ruined, but it adds to the charm. And I know that there are onsens that are set in old mansions, but not sure if there is one that looks like they've been f they've flooded the entire place and that joins to the ocean. If you know of one, let me know. Uh, but I love that the backstory for this onsen was that an old couple just let part of their house flood and turn into a bath. I think that is the best ever foundation for the start of a business operation. One of my favorite things about Aria is whenever we get these quiet moments of sitting with our characters who are just admiring the beauty of aqua uh, or of life in general. Uh, we also had like Alicia and Akari knitting in front of the fireplace or later watching the snow bugs return to the trees or like the three girls who sat outside watching the stars. Uh, it is just nice to have an anime where we can bask in the silence along with the characters. The other consistent motif in Arya was the use of darkness. And in previous episodes, darkness has been used to lend a supernatural, very mysterious atmosphere to the story. And in this episode, we got Akari looking out into that long, dark corridor. But as always, we got like a couple of seconds of darkness and then slightly foreboding sound effects before we're just right back to the happy music and the good tones. Uh, when they return to that dark corridor later, or it was another different dark, empty corridor, there was a sense of, oh, this is a bad idea and it's going to end badly, even though it was Alicia leading them. And for a split crazy second, uh, my conspiratorial mind was like, oh, this is it. This is when Alicia 
peels off her perfect smiley face and shows them all that she is actually a psychopath murderer. Especially when she disappeared around the corner into the darkness. And had it been any other show, uh, it would have been the classic horror setup. And I suspect the writers of Arya were deliberately playing on that. But of course, it doesn't pan out like that. And it just turns out that Alicia knew this path out to the beautiful exterior of the onsen that connects directly to the sea. I also appreciated the entrance later of both Athena and Akira, and it makes total sense that Alicia would want to spend her well-deserved rest with her best girlfriends. Unfortunately, it meant that Aika's lovely, wonderful holiday turned into a living hell. Finally, my tourist shots for these episodes. Uh, episode 9, it was this shot of Obanchan's home with that lovely autumn-coloured background and intriguingly featuring this like sheer drop uh, of a retaining wall. So kind of surprising height there. Uh, in that episode, actually, too, I enjoyed the sound effects that went with these kind of scenic shots. Uh, so whether it was the bird sounds during the day and then at night you'd hear the crickets. Yeah, so I have to say, Arya um, just smashing it with the atmospheric sound design. And then for episode 10, um, it was this rare evening shot of the Arya Company headquarters because that is just my favorite time of day when the daylight's just about died out and I would kill for that view. Okay, episode 11 of Aria, let the chill begin. If you guys are ready to sync this up, let's do it in three, two, one, play. What is Alice philosophizing about, like, the present? Is there such thing as a future and a past? Is all we have now? I don't know. <laughs> hmm, this is a depressing aria. Like, depressing aqua. I don't think we've seen grey skies a lot. Okay, it's a still winter. The second winter. I don't know how Mars seasons work. It would be much longer. Oh, lead coloured. I thought she was going to say lead clouds. Silver angels. As in, uh, like, Akatsuki and his weather conjurers. Hmm, it's a different kind of vibe when you have this song playing in against the uh the dark clouds. Do they still make it snow, the weather guys, the salamanders? <laughs> the little hat's really cute. Real string instruments. So good. These three are inseparable <laughs> at this point. It's interesting that even though they create their own weather and they control it that they would still replicate the four seasons as they are like technically they could have good weather all around right like good warm weather 
<gasps> They're all together. Athena as well. <laughs> <laughs> Our living hell is here. I wanna I would love more moments of the three older girls together. <laughs> so natural in asking for a drink. And she? <laughs> they are very close friends, but I suppose the younger girls are still getting used to that idea. <laughs> Damn, is she piping cream under that hot chocolate? Ugh, that's so nice. Hmm, interesting. I'm surprised, actually, that Akira is the social glue of this group. Hmm, that definitely adds to her character as well being the one to make sure that they stay in touch. <laughs> oh, so... There is a problem. <laughs> Even her laugh is super eccentric. There you go. Even though you're not, it feels like there is an expectation that you're meant to stick with your own undines in your own company. Oh, <gasps> young. Akira, young Alicia. I love that short hair on her. There we go. I wonder why. Like, why did Abata and make it like that? Akira had to make excuses to turn up at Aria all the time. <laughs> so basically, the younger girls mirrored their older senpais. Exactly. Exactly what Aika said. I love this so much. <laughs> oh, she was treating people to pizza even back then. President Ari hasn't aged a day. And Athena's like, 
who? I don't know. <laughs> I love her face. Athena's like squishy face you know I think Athena might possibly be on the spectrum just how she is like her focus on certain things she's so sweet also Okay. <laughs> Akira is also the same as Aika in terms of her always wanting to be a step ahead, preparing for the future. There you go, normal group training. Did they not figure out that it was Athena? Oh. Hey, that signature Alicia move. Oh God. <laughs> it's all the headbangs that she's gotten from the, from the bridges. That's why she's so special and so gifted. I do love the, is this the episode where we find out Athena, like her gift? Yes, this is the Athena focused episode. Oh, is Alicia bad at singing? It's the same one she's still singing.
stop in traffic. Even the salamanders can hear her. Oh, I like the animation of her face. Oh, that's a beautiful fading out of that last note. Then back to a pond face. Damn, can you imagine the projection of her voice for it to have stopped the city like that <laughs> from that distance? <laughs> oh god. I love that Athena is so damn amazing that all she really needs to do is sing that one song and it's that one song that's kept her going as the one of the best Undines for so long. Oh, do we get to hear Akita sing though? Mm. It's sad now that, I mean, they each have their own companies to work at. Ooh. This is so sad. Then more mono no water. It's like in the impermanence of things, anything. Yeah. It's sad. You can be sad over it, but also appreciate that it even happened. No, the baby is sad. Sometimes gently and sometimes harshly. Not only is she gifted in singing, but she is gifted at just reaching in and touching your heart with lines like that. Huh. Very subtle difference. There we go. There's that reference to the first line that Alice is talking about. Oh, this episode is just killing me.
Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many times they get to meet like this a year. I'm surprised though, that they didn't put the dots together and, and be like, oh, these three must have been close when they were younger and that's why they're still such good friends, even though they don't see each other that often. I don't know why Akari looks particularly cute in this episode. She's going to say, just focus on the now. Like, we'll, we're still seeing each other now. Don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I guess such a mom. I love her heels. That's interesting. Maybe Ika's the one that's most torn up about this. She's just being strong for the other girls. Is this a new song? Wait, or is this the one that always plays at the end? <laughs> I'm so bad. Oh god, this is so romantic, <laughs> the setting. But it's romantic, like, friendship, you know. Alice's face. <laughs> She's always the one that's like, oh my god, you too. <gasps> oh, this episode just like out of nowhere. Is she eavesdropping? She's just going to stay outside in the cold. <laughs> oh, tourist shot. No. Yeah, this, I was going to say this episode out of nowhere, just, just hidden you in the fields. That's interesting takeaway. Okay, it was a different song. <laughs> that was a super dramatic, um, just like uh, rushing on all the feels kind of song. I liked that episode a lot. Uh, it was essentially a big advice session from the older undines to the younger ones and sharing with them their experience of growing up together and training together as young undines and appreciating 
the absolute joy that was, but also knowing how to face the fact that with the passage of time, uh, it was something that was never meant to last forever. Uh, and learning how to deal with that and to learn how to think about it, to appreciate it. Things come and go in life. Most things do, but and that's okay. But also certain things don't change either. Like their friendship obviously stayed just as strong even over the years. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of great lines in that. And I also especially love that it was Athena when Alice was feeling really sad about how eventually that's going to happen to the three of them. That it was Athena who uh, gave her that piece of advice, you know, that who encouraged her to look at it in a different way and to um, not necessarily not necessarily not be sad about it, but to cherish it all the more, knowing the nature of time and what it does to the people and things in your life. Man, there's a lot to talk about there. We'll go to the next episode. Episode 12, let's jump right into it in three, two, one, play. Hmm? <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> oh, does she travel back in time? Is this the time travel episode? Like back to the beginning of the establishment of Aqua before there were any canals dug. Never had to shovel snow in my life. <laughs> Looks hard. Pure white powder. <laughs> It's another deep <laughs> message about how it's just life just keeps rolling on. It's the same thing over and over again. <laughs> She's such a nice boss. <sighs> Hmm. Even Alicia thinks there's nothing special about it. She does have a gift for that. I like how in almost in every second or third line of dialogue, you can dig something, a deeper meaning out of them. <laughs> like they may be talking about an old bridge that no one values anymore, but they're also hinting to the larger lesson that there are certain things in life where, um, you know, people value things differently. And there are things that are seemingly normal that hold great value for people who may look at it differently. Hmm. Oh, that's a nice shot front. I do like these winter scenes. Interesting that we're not getting the lyrics this time. It's almost like she's singing through like a glass. Oh, 
I wonder why. There's got to be significance behind why they've changed the OP to this. Hmm. It's a very dead forest. Oh, it is very different. It just looks like a sh more of a shed more than a bridge. <laughs> It's super dark. There's that darkness again. I don't know, something weird's gonna happen. Oh, is it another cat thing? Is that why President Arya's like, oh my god, my people. Oh, here we go. Okay, so... Oh my gosh, that is... Oh, terrifying. Okay, at least there's, a, like, light at the other side. Hey, we hadn't had a supernatural episode for a while. Time portal. Interesting, there's no water in that canal. Clothes. She's from the future. Or is this Earth? No. It's like, what's that? What's that? <laughs> so basically, Akari is a crazy person in this world. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is still Aqua. But, oh, it's definitely time travel. Back to the past. I love how trusting people are even in this time period. They're like, a strange girl came out of nowhere, calls the cat her president. Why not invite her home back to tea? <laughs> Always a cat involved. I like that she's got a full, um, full shelf of books. Oh, there we go.
is there an Aika, like someone like Aika in this world? I'm just, you know what's crazy? They're going to have an entire day of conversation and never cover the fact that one of them potentially time traveled back. <laughs> Is she is Akari even gonna mention the fact that she came from somewhere where it's full on winter? Oh, that's nice. I like that wooden frame with the vines growing on it. <laughs> so corny. <laughs> The corny people found each other. Hmm. Damn, it's got a greenhouse and everything. Right, I guess I don't have any of the um, piping systems installed yet. <laughs> it's such a weird place to be filming. Has she figured it out yet? No, it's Akari. She won't figure it out. <laughs> a year and a half ago, but this girl came six months ago. Her finger. <laughs> okay, so she's kind of like a mix between Akari and uh, Athena. <laughs> it's like a rolled cabbage. <laughs> it's bizarre that Akari just walked a few steps into this place where people have no idea what Undines are. <laughs> Hmm, I wonder why. <laughs> Could she take this girl back to that bridge? Or would she somehow evaporate into thin air? Is she gaslighting Akari? <laughs> mm. 
No, I mean, she can't. It's actually, it's oddly frustrating that they can talk past each other like this. But also it's just Arya's brand of never really having the characters dig into the lore and ask questions about it. Oh, she's got it now. Hey, call back. Can Akari tell the people now that she's from the future or will that mess up the timeline? Gosh, that girl looks like um, Aika, the blue-haired one. <gasps> he looks like the postman, like a little boy version of him. Oh. oh my gosh, that is like a mini Aika and a mini Akira together. That's so weird. Are they like the their ancestors? <laughs> okay, so she's got it. But she's just acting as if this is not something insane that has just happened she's like oh i just walked over a bridge into the past mm. it's long hard slog to get those canals that now exist Does she suspect? She has to. That's oddly specific. Mm. Yeah, a kind of miracle. <laughs> this is a very idealized version of like settling a place of the pioneering life. Hey, is that song again? I guess, where's the water coming from? Like the ocean? Some dam that they've built? Some reservoir?
Slowly, that's surely. <laughs> oh, so many corny lines from Arkady these two episodes. Hey. This feels like a final ending episode. It's like looking back on all the times uh, since episode one. <gasps> Memory montage. Oh man, that was a sad episode, that one. Abashan. Because it represents so much more than just water. <laughs> okay, that is actually a massive, really wide canal. <laughs> I think Akiko knows where Akari came from. That's just not verbalizing it. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I haven't heard that as a symbolic value of cats before. What does that word mean? I can look it up after this. Avenue. <laughs> Do you hear that sound effect when you walk across that bridge and you, you know, jump through space and time? Man's. Oh, okay. Thank you. There we go her future so she knew I wonder if there's a limit to how many times you can cross that bridge and travel into the past it's probably just the one time right it's kind of like when she went back to that alleyway with the previous um <laughs> cat she couldn't find it again Why is she so overcome with emotion? I guess, well, she did travel to the past and meet someone who no longer lives. I like the song, even though it's um very typical ballady, kind of corny <laughs> composition. Oh, that sweet jazz guitar. Hmm, so many questions about how these bridges to the past work. I assume because Alicia said that people have just stopped visiting that bridge, that uh, very, very, a rare few like Akari actually have the capacity to experience it as a time portal otherwise it would be this huge deal and protected sacred site right as opposed to what it is now which is just an abandoned old bridge that no one finds interesting anymore i wonder if that also suggests that uh this attitude of akari's that they always talk about this her ability to see the wonder in everything if that is in itself kind of a superpower in this world on aqua because it means that she's in touch with the most uh seemingly normal things but behind which lie these supernatural happenings 
<laughs> that only reveal themselves to people who actually take the time to appreciate the normal things. So no, it's kind of like having a sixth set of eyes, not a sixth set of eyes, like a sixth sense or a third eye. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. I also like throughout the episode, <laughs> you probably tell, I still find it amusing that Akari is so accepting of these things that she encounters, even though for any normal person to be able to jump back in time to the past, to the beginning of the settlement of men of, uh, not Manhome, of Aqua and near Venezia, that is just something that she goes with the flow of. Uh, she won't freak out. Um, she won't be like, oh my god, am I going to be stuck in the past? She won't worry about these things. She kind of just lets things happen and things always turn out and she always meets kind people uh, or there's nothing ominous about this supernatural time jumping. It's more uh, the lesson is always to um, appreciate the hard work that has gone into settling aqua and to appreciate things again uh, appreciate what you have when you have it mm. hey episode 13 of aria season one uh the very last episode although it may be the ova because i feel like the last episode definitely had season finale vibes uh so let's sync this up in three Two, one, go. Cute. She always sounds so melancholy when she says those things. It's New Year's. <laughs> that contraption just to heat up a kettle. I don't know how I'd survive a year with 24 months in it. I'd probably feel like the year would never end. Sometimes you just want the year to end, you know, so you can feel like you have a fresh start. Oh, pretty. Hmm, that's weird. Okay. Oh, New Year's party. Space shuttle. Oh. That's what they use to uh, control the weather. Yeah. Whoa. But they're being used to, uh, I guess, light up the, the New Year's party. It has been a while since I've celebrated New Year's out in the public. All those people are smushing together on public transport. I'm sure it's really nice here, though, on Aqua. <laughs> Damn. It's pulling out all the stops. The exorbitant prices you have to pay in tourist spots <laughs> if you're visiting a city and, you know, celebrating New Year's there. It's so pretty. Man, those colours with the lights.
Man, it must be a trip if you are actually Venetian and live in Venice watching Aria. Because <laughs> it's like... Oh. Hey, that was extra part of the OP that we've not gotten before. Oh god. I wish they weren't talking in this part. <laughs> That was beautiful. Hey, Woody. <laughs> Set aside their inhibitions. Hey, the girl who started it all. Is that the eye theme? <laughs> this episode is so different already. We've not heard this kind of music in Aria before. <laughs> it's like a typical J-pop song. Aww. No, she just stole away. <laughs> this song is just messing with my mind. It's a very moe kind of song. That's right, because Akari just reports on everyone in her emails without their permission <laughs> this is Yakuza older brother. Just meet all the people that she's heard about. Yeah. So she's got a she's met Aika. Did she meet Alice? I don't actually remember. I think Alice came afterwards. Just gonna give her some stack of cash. <laughs> Oh, okay. Mm, that. <laughs> oh, that's cool. It's like those um, islands off the coast of Venice that specialize in glass blowing. I forgot their names, but that was really cool to see when you're there. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just say Arrivederci? It's so funny how they all care about the opinion of a little girl. <laughs> Hey, that was Al, the gnome. I think 
Yeah. <gasps> it's not even Ica's fault. Oh no, did Akari put in something about how he loves like Aika and there's something going on between them? Unfortunately for us, that will never happen, but at least it's happening for I. <laughs> Love her face, Ika's face. Oh, <gasps> no! She took the train. Or maybe she has her own personal private shit. I mean, wouldn't be surprised given her status in the society. Hey. Uh, you know what, the three of them, like the older girls, Alicia, Akira, and Athena, they probably visited Grandma a lot when they were younger too. Obashan is the only one who doesn't have anything to be embarrassed about while Cuddy <laughs> wrote about her. <laughs> and probably Alicia too. Oh, it's, there's that Aria company bias. Oh, Akatsuki. Hmm, another dark alleyway. It's always when they're looking for that damn cat, they run into these situations. Oh no. I guess, I don't know, she drops them so they can find their way back? I don't, I don't think they can hear the bells, right? Or they can hear the bells. Or is it just that President Arya can hear them? Hey, wasn't this the previous place that they visited? Hey. <gasps> oh, that was just... Wait, was that just a vision Akari was having? No, I saw it too. Oh. 
Oh, is this trying to say that everyone in the present has connections to people who built Aqua in the past? <laughs> Again, just love that they had what you would call a hallucination of the past. It was a shared vision, though, so it wouldn't have been a personal hallucination. It was like a collective hallucination. And then all of a sudden it's gone and they're not freaked out by it at all. They're more curious. Just follow the lights and you'll go back home. <laughs> That does look very cool. I guess they're not going to make any mention of what they just, the weirdness that they just experienced. Hmm? What's a trash tossing event? <laughs> That's kind of cool. All right, symbolizing the welcoming of a new year, making way for new things. <gasps> Bye, though. Those three, whenever I see those three together, I just get chills. Sad and grateful and happy. All at once. It's complicated. <laughs> Okay, so I love that everyone counts in Italian as well. <gasps> Akasi threw away his coat. <laughs> hey, it's very folksy celebratory music. Exactly like the kind you'd hear at like a, a masked ball. And those classic guitars. Oh, was that Mochi? Athena. <laughs> Yo, Kasuke can play the violin. Hmm, my respect for him has increased. Now it's a quick party. It's just like the dead of the night when everyone's drunk and stumbling their way home. Ika scored a spot next to Alicia. <laughs> Good on her. <laughs> oh 
<laughs> Why don't they just move to Aqua? Let's make it official. Right, so President Arya speaks baby. <laughs> Has Alice always been that short? <laughs> Trust Akari to say that. gonna say hmm New year, new season. And it started and ended with I. Damn, this is a beautiful moment and shot. Oh, they're family. I love Alicia. I mean, I know we're halfway through our year, but it's a good attitude to hold at any time, you know. Tomorrow's a, always a new start. I feel like they said that specifically to their audience. <laughs> hey, that's the end of season one. Sometimes certain episodes are filled with so much uh, sweet lines and Things like what Akari would say about how the sun, the light flooding in is like flooding warmth into her heart and things like that. <laughs> it's, it's corny, but also because the show is so upfront about being straight up so direct with 
this kind of super positive outlook on life that surprisingly I don't mind how cavity inducing or diabetes inducing the dialogue is sometimes uh, especially when it harks back to or refers back to the relationships that we've seen grow between these characters since the very beginning since episode one I did enjoy the uh, the circularity sort of a full circle that we did starting with I in episode one and then finishing with I in this episode and showing that she has grown a lot with her in her relationship with her sister and they've sort of figured things out and they both love Aqua now and I has a much much deeper understanding of Aqua and through Akari's very exposing emails (laughs) and we too uh, have been going along that same journey of discovering Aqua as a planet and the people who inhabit it who are filled with nothing but kindness and and the will to see Aqua succeed uh, and just conviction in uh, the endeavors that they pursue on this planet. So nothing but good feelings from Arya. Um, <laughs> even me, as someone who likes political intrigue and, you know, uh, conspiracy theory kind of shows. <laughs> I am still surprised that I was able to take to Arya so easily. Uh, maybe it's the chill part of me. I do really, really appreciate how you can sit through an episode of Arya and while still taking in some really important lessons uh, about life and s- advice on how to approach life so that it's more enjoyable or um so that you're it's kind of hard to explain like approach it's advice on how to approach life in a way that helps you really live it as opposed to let things happen without you really dwelling on it or without really learning from it I don't even know if I'm making sense, but yeah, I really appreciate that part of Arya and how they've managed to infuse those life lessons while also making it such a chill show to relax to. Like you don't feel burdened by these heavy life lessons that they're just um, conveying all the time, if you care to notice. Um, yeah. Last sum up for uh, this episode, first season of Arya. Uh, So let's rewind back to episode 11, uh, where we got to see um, what happens rarely. Uh, The three senpais, Alicia, Athena, and Akira get together for some hot chocolate and some memories. Um, That episode really packed a punch. Not only did we get a long solo acapella performance from Athena, which was magical. Uh, and I particularly loved when she sings down in her lower register, but also we got flashbacks, um, that told the story of the friendship between those three girls, uh, which in a lot of ways mirrors the friendship that grew between, uh, Akari, Aika and Alice, um, One, in one sense, like the way that they each have their own strengths and weaknesses, uh, both in terms of their Undine skills and in terms of their personalities, Um, but they complement and make each other better people and better Undines. Uh, And that is the best kind of friendship to have, one that is built on mutual respect and an openness to learn from each other. Uh, and of course they have great times together too. That message is just timeless. Uh, the, the other part, I guess, was the whole, how the whole issue of how, um, this kind of golden era or friendship sometimes, uh, or anything really in life, most things don't last forever, uh, or at least they don't last in the same form that they used to be in. 
uh, time changes everything. And I loved it when Athena said, sometimes it changes things slowly, sometimes in a really harsh, abrupt way. Uh, so despite this, you know, despite that, uh, the nature of friendships, for example, will change and you may never be able to go back to, uh, quote, the good old days, there will always be other things that come up, um, things that you can enjoy anew. You know, um, new things will, new things and new people will enter into your life. Like for Athena, she still loves her job uh, as an undine, and plus she has new girls, new core hires like Alice to train, which again is another new source of joy for her. Um, also, every now and then, even though the frequency is much less, obviously, she can go over and have a great time with Alicia and uh, Akira. Like Akira, I think it was, he said, don't say that the good old days were fun. You got to add two words. It's like, say the good old days were fun as well. So think of it not as a time that you've lost, but a time that you once enjoyed on top of all the things that you now enjoy in the present. Um, so I think, yeah, just a great, great message, uh, especially for those of us who, you know, have more life to look back on and are like, oh my God, you know, I just don't know where the time went. Also in that episode, some interesting things about Undine culture, I guess, that we got insights into. Uh, I got the sense from how the girls talked about how they came to train together despite being from different companies, that it is still highly unusual for Undines from different companies to train together. Um, that the groups of three that we see that we know best from the show are really the exception to the rule. Um, not that there's any hard and fast rule preventing them from training together, but it just seems like this thing where um, it's still, it's not normal. <laughs> We also confirmed from Alicia that it is an actual policy or a philosophy of the ARIA company to keep their company small. And by small, they mean by hiring literally only one trainee or one uh, apprentice Undine at a time, which was fascinating. Uh, also, I think the parallel between Athena and Alice were interesting to see in that episode. I mean, they may have extremely different personalities and one is a total klutz and the other is a total perfectionist, but they both went through that unique experience of being singled out early on as the most talented Undine in the company, uh, kind of like an up and coming star with all of its adjacent expectations. Um, and the pressure and the isolation that comes with that. So um, knowing that they have a lot more in common than at first sight uh, was kind of gratifying. And you can sort of see like that they have a lot of shared interests and uh, common experiences to keep building their relationship, which really didn't come off to a, like, which didn't start on a great note. Next was episode 12. So that was the A Bridge to the Past episode uh, <laughs> that no one else has discovered um, that the, that bridge is actually a portal, a time portal is fascinating. Uh, or maybe it's not. Like, I think what is actually happening is that it's only someone like Akari who has whatever power she possesses inside of her, the power to see wonderful or unusual things, only those people can really, when they come into contact with the bridge, make that connection to the past. Uh, also in that episode, I remember just waiting for Akari to clue in on the fact that she had actually time traveled. And I think it was the data card that she saw Akiko pull out uh, to send a message that reminded her of the first time that she'd seen something like that. Um, which then confirmed to her that she was speaking to someone who was an early settler of Aqua. Uh, it just, so it was a data card and not anything else, like the fact that Akiko had never heard of Aria Company or had no idea what an Undine was and that the canals themselves weren't even filled with water. None of that clicked for Akari. It was the data card, <laughs> which I thought was really funny. Uh, I think the main message in that episode 
was this emphasis on the importance of maintaining a connection to the past. So for Akari, being able to experience firsthand how hard it was for the first pioneering settlers in Aqua and how long of a wait it was for them to actually even get the water running through the canals and just the joy of having that finally happen. All of that greatly increased her already significant appreciation and respect for the hard work that those people put in, um, how they faced down impossible odds in order for Aqua to be built Um, in order for her world that she inhabits now to even exist. The fact that Akiko talked about how in the future uh, Aqua is going to be filled with bakeries and flower shops and cafes and Akari was able to confirm that, um, that was a really wonderful moment. Uh, Like, I wish it could happen in real life where you just go back and you talk to people from the past and you can chat about how things have changed and how things well haven't changed. The other thing about connecting to the past, I mean, for us here, I mean, me personally, I've always loved learning about history because I think it is important to know how we got to where we are today and the people who made that happen so that we can learn from past mistakes and also appreciate the things and and the rights that we do have. Of course, actual real history, human history in our world is way more complex than Arya's or Aqua's, it seems, and also filled with awful and horrible things, as well as the good and wholesome ones. And finally, episode 13, or the OVA, uh, New Year's, like a highly appropriate event to... Uh, focus on because it's one of those things where it's like symbolically you're making way for the new things to come obviously it's like a new season will be coming after this but also new year's is one of those times where you're kind of both looking back at the past and reflecting on how far you've come and what you've learned as well as looking forward to the future and hoping that it's going to be a better one uh which is something that we probably should do more of, this whole reflecting on where we've been and where we're going and not just leave it for New Year's. Uh, At the same time, though, the other lesson that Arya has been drilling into us this whole season is kind of the flip side of that or maybe the other side of the same coin where you don't dwell too much on the past or worry too much about the future, but instead you learn to appreciate the present and enjoy the things that you have now so it's just a balance of those two things and the conclusion is life is complicated (laughs) so uh with that i'm gonna sign off for now please let me know uh what you thought of these episodes or the entire season really of aria or even just how much you love aria i have received couple of comments where um of, from people who think Arya is the absolute best anime they've ever watched ever so it's nice to know that there are people out there who appreciate uh, a show like this so I will see you guys for the next season of Arya soon um I I hope for those of you who started this show with me that you have found a new anime that uh, you can enjoy uh I am really glad that I listened to that one person (laughs) who recommended this to me many many months ago uh, and it just always leaves me feeling refreshed and better about myself even or especially if I've had a rough day and I really hope that it does that for you guys as well so until next time take care and I'll see you soon